This week on the Midweek Move, Acts chapter 2, where are they, what is happening, who's there, and what does that mean to us next on the Midweek Move. Welcome to the Midweek Move. I am Scott, and again, joining me this week is Dallas. Hey, how's it going? Glad to have you guys uh, with us. I'm glad to hear with you. Hey, this is going to be an amazing um, deep dive today. We're going to dive deep. We're going to go in. Um, we say kind of we're going to go in hard. We're going to go <laughs> after this thing. Uh, we're not going to ease our way into this. We're going to go in, and we're going to go in hard. So, Acts chapter 2, last week we did Acts 1. Uh, we kind of left it where they were making what seemed like a practical decision. Right. But what we learned was it was very supernatural. Right. They were actually fulfilling prophecy with just a simple decision. Right. And I think one of the great takeaways from last week was that uh, we've been using this terminology of practically prophetic. Yeah. And I really think that where we left last week, and this really came up in a lot of the responses we got from last week was... Man, I had never, I had read Acts chapter one forever and never thought about something so practical being prophetic. They were fulfilling the prophetic word. So that's kind of where we left it mm -hmm. uh, last week. And where we left them was we left them in an upper room. Right. They're trying to figure out what's going on. W what do we do with this? Jesus is gone. Like we kind of know what he was saying, but we kind of don't. Mm -hmm. And what are we waiting for? Who are we waiting for? Right. And what's next? So that's kind of where we left it off. Dallas, do you have any kind of thoughts from last week kind of moving into this week? Yeah, just as we get into this, I really want you guys to get the idea that this is just happening right afterwards. Like sometimes when we read these stories and we look at these chapters, we're like, okay, this is an entirely different section. There's this is entirely new. No, this is the same group of individuals. Yep. They have, they've been through a lot of things already. They've been in an upper room for several days. They've been praying in one accord. They're, they're, they're grieving over the loss of their, of their, of their, their rabbi, their master. Yeah. And, but they know that there's something coming. There's still the anticipation of we're waiting for something to happen. And so, again, as we dive into it, keep that in mind. This is a continuing story. This is not just another moment later down the line. Yeah, line. they haven't had a week between yeah. the Midweek Move podcast. <laughs> exactly. Right? And they're right. like, oh, we've figured all this out. This is No, no, no. This is an ongoing narrative. Like, right. they are living this in real time, just like we're living our lives right now in exactly. real time. We're we're present right now in this moment. We're living this in real time. That's where they're at. They're, they're real people. Right. They're not characters <laughs> in a story. You know, it's, it's not a bedtime story. This is real. And so right off Acts chapter two, verse one, and I'm going to have you kind of take the first step into this, Dallas. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. So take us first step into that. You yeah. kind of know where I'm at with that. Yeah. And well, I mean, the day of Pentecost is, it's a Jewish holiday. This is a feast of the Lord, not, not a feast of the Jews. It's a feast of the Lord. And so good. <laughs> so good. He's known me for a long time. Right. <laughs> I've always hated it when people are like, Oh, the feasts are just for the Jews. Never one time in scripture. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get our, that's what we follow right. is the word of God. Not one time are any of the feasts ever called the feasts of the Jews. Mm -hmm. They're always called the feasts of the Lord, not the feasts of the Jews. So there's something to, to say to us as believers, even in 2021, right. the feasts, like there's something to say to us. So again, feast of the Lord, we're here at this day of Pentecost, the feast of Pentecost. So. Right. Yeah, and so this takes place 50 days after Passover, which has a whole slew of other meetings deep into it, which if you dive which into that. Which Jesus fulfilled all of that in the Passover. Every bit of it. And then yep. you have this first fruits festival that takes place. Yep. And it's interesting because what we're about to see is the kind of a first fruits of the harvest of souls that's yep. about to take place. And so this is kind of the, the groundwork. This is, a, this is a holy celebration. The Jews have gathered together. Um, the city is full. And the same as the, the people uh, that Jesus sent here, they're here, yeah, they're here to fulfill something specific that Jesus sent them, but they're also celebrating uh, Pentecost. Yeah, and there is some there is some wiggle room in how long the 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 disciples and the followers of Christ were in the upper room. There mm -hmm. is a little bit of wiggle room. Some sure. say ten days, some say the entirety, some say forty days. Right. 
Uh, we're not absolute 100% sure. Mm -hmm. We do know that it was days plural that right. they were together in an upper room praying. So it wasn't just like, hey, we went in for a 10 minute prayer meeting and we're good to go. <laughs> no, these people were, you know, the Bible uses that word travail. Right. They were walking through disappointment, discouragement, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I'm sure anxiety, oh, yeah. maybe a little bit of fear. Yeah. Like we know what Jesus has told us. And by the way, you guys remember when Jesus told us they hated him and they're going to hate us? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not sure what we're stepping into here. Right. So they're, they're ready to celebrate this feast as Jews, but yet there's also this undercurrent of uncertainty and anxiety and fear. Has that ever happened for you? Like, Maybe it was a, a time of that should have been celebratory, but yet there was an undercurrent of maybe things that were going on in your own life, right? That maybe had a little bit of anxiety. So how do you fully celebrate and yet fully try to walk through some anxiety and fear, right? So they're going through all of this. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Man, this is so key. And, and we talk about this all the time, being in unity and being in one accord are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. You can be in unity around a goal right? and then meet that goal. The Tower of Babel, they were unified around a goal, right? <laughs> yeah, they were. Building a tower up for ourselves. Let's make a name for ourselves up to heaven. They were unified around a goal and they were accomplishing that goal. But one accord takes on more of a, we're not just unified around a goal. We are one in spirit. Right. One mind, one accord, like we are going the same way, not to reach a goal in the natural, but this has a spirit of God, not undertone, but it is the spirit of God is leading us into this one mind and one accord in one place. So they're still in this place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, this is the beginnings of what Jesus has told them was going to happen. Right. Now, I'm not sure that they are fully sure yet that this is exactly what's going on because they've seen a lot of stuff. Yeah, they have. They've seen dead the dead come out of <laughs> not just Lazarus and his resurrection, but they've seen the dead come out of graves at the resurrection of Jesus, at the crucifixion of Jesus, resurrection of Jesus. Right. People have come out of the graves and are walking around Jerusalem. Right. This isn't the walking dead. <laughs> Like, this is for real. Right. This is like real time. And so now there comes from heaven this mighty rushing wind, which can even harken back to the Old Testament of how God showed up right. in certain ways. When you talk about Elijah, we're talking about clouds, we're talking about wind, we're talking right. about all these different things. So, and it says it filled, it filled the whole house. So we're not necessarily at a personage yet. Right. It, meaning the wind, right? right? And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each one of them. So, like, I know pictures have kind of depicted this. You got all these people sitting there, and there are flames <laughs> above their heads. Right. Like, I'm not sure exactly. But the descriptive nature of this, there's wind, and there is fire in some sense that they're seeing. Right. And one sat upon each one of them. Why is that key right there? Because it's a promise. Uh, it's part of the hopeful promise of you will receive it. And it's individuals. Each individual person is receiving whatever this gifting is. It's not just a, a singular person. It's not just like, so all good. right, here's uh, Peter. Obviously, he's the yeah. guy who's going to take over things for us. It's, it's everyone, every individual here who has been leaning in, who's been in one accord, who has been passionately seeking Whatever the promise is that has been given, again, they don't know what this is. There's no guy that goes, right. okay, there's going to be fire, and there's going to be wind. There, there's nothing to tell them that. Right. There's like, I just want more of you, God. And every individual here who has been seeking this, they have received what has been promised. Every name had a flame. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so it's like every name had a flame. So it's like, what does that mean to us? Well, it means that, yes, there is... When you gather together with other believers and you're worshiping, man, there is a touch of God that comes on that whole thing. Mm -hmm. But 
in the midst of that, there is something for every single individual. Right. God has something for you, right. right? God has something for me. God has something for you. And so then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. Now, Jesus had told them that the Holy Spirit, he had equated the Holy Spirit with wind. He had equated the Holy Spirit with like breath, pneuma, mm -hmm. right? He had equated the, the Holy Spirit with fire. He baptized you in the Holy Spirit in fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right, Dallas, take the first step into verse four. <laughs> so real simple, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. This is an indwelling. We call this now the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is almost like you're, you're engulfed with them. Now, we had a conversation just a couple days ago as of the... Um, in one of our classes, we have a class called Prophetic People, and we have this terrible habit in the Holy in the in our circles, our Pentecostal circles, of going, "Do you have the Holy Ghost?" And we're going, you know, "Do you have the Holy Spirit?" Well, obviously, to get saved, you have to have the Holy Spirit. That's right. Our it, spirit bears witness with His spirit that we are children of God. Right. This is something different. Yep. This is an encounter that's completely different from the salvation experience. And then you have this aspect where the people begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so, again, we had this supernatural experience taking place of God moving in people as they encounter the Holy Ghost. And this is one of those things where people debate how this happens, what it looks like. Uh, but there is no denial that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when you, there is a feeling of the Holy Spirit, something's going to happen. Yeah, there's yeah. going to be a shifting. There's going to be a supernatural shift that's going to take place in the individual. And you can say yes or no right. to that. Right. Like we have always said, an encounter with God it, there is no way you can walk away with an encounter mm -hmm. from a, an encounter with God the same. Right. Even if you say no. Right. There's still something that has happened. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that's going on here, it's not like they knew that they were going to pray in another language. Mm -hmm. Like that wasn't something they knew. Right. There was no thing in the context. That's that. right. So it wasn't like Jesus was like, hey, here's exactly how it's going to happen. And we've really covered that, that... They really didn't know. All this is brand new to them. Mm -hmm. They're not sure. Is it a guy? Is it something else? Well, this is that, right. which we'll see here in just a second. So there's something else I want to dig into, but let's let's kind of go on. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Why are people from every nation, um, Jewish people from every nation, why are they there in Jerusalem? Because it's Pentecost. Because it's a feast. It's the feast of the Lord. It's the feast. One of the major feasts where you come up to Jerusalem, right? You don't go down to Jerusalem. You come right. up to Jerusalem. All right. And when this sound occurred, now, when it connotates this sound, is that tongues? Is it the wind? Some say that it's the wind, that when they heard the sound, because it says that as there was a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. Mm -hmm. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. Now, we're not just talking about Hey, there's a hundred people hanging out at the feast. Right. We're talking thousands of people. Right. We're talking about concert level. Right. Thousands. We're talking about college football game kind of level. Thousands upon thousands of people. Exactly. And this is something we can we can confirm even within the text itself later in the chapter where it yep. tells us a very specific number later. That's right. So the multitude came together and they were confused. Why is it that we believe that every time we gather in worship or we gather together to worship God and that God does something in us that somehow everybody's going to know exactly what's happening. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like they're confused. Like what is going on? Because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Now, what we're talking about here, and we're, we'll get into this even more as we go into the book of Acts, mm -hmm. is that there is a, a, a gifting of the Holy Spirit of tongues. Mm-hmm. Then there is also a prayer language, personal, right? Every name has a flame, personal, right? Of praying in the spirit, right? So here there is a different, a definite gifting of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Why? Because everyone who's here from all the different nations mm -hmm. hears them speak in their own language, right? Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear 
each in our own language in which we were born. So how is it that this sound is coming? How is it that all these different languages are being spoken? And all of us, we have different languages because we've come from different nations. How are we hearing this in our own language? Verse 9. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, meaning those who have become Jews, right? Mm-hmm. And proselytes, Cretans, and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Mm. So they even recognize that this is God. Right. Because it's declaring the wonderful works of God. Listen, right. you we have to be able to discern. Listen, if evil is being spoken, mm-hmm. that's not of God. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, you don't even need a serious discernment gift to know that. No, it's just one on one. Right. If <laughs> if something's being spoken that's drawing you away from God or pointing away from God, guess what? It's probably not from God. Mm-hmm. But here, the the tongues roar out. This gift that's been given of the Holy Spirit is roaring out. All these people are hearing in their own language. Now, let's cover this for a second. So in this, Dallas, it's almost like um, you're somewhere and there are uh, Italians, there are mm-hmm. Greeks, there are, um, there are uh, Filipinos, there are Indians, there are Brazilians, and you're hanging out with all these people, and all of a sudden you start praying out loud and you're speaking all these different languages and these people hear you, right? Mm-hmm. Like... That's the context. Right. Like, you don't know those languages. You haven't learned them. You didn't get a software program to teach you. Right. Like, it's supernatural. Right. And then those people now have an opportunity to believe that, receive that, or not. Right. Here, it says that we all believe this is from God because they're speaking the wonderful works of God in our own languages. Right. Right? Speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed. So they weren't just amazed in a good way, but they were also maybe not confused, but perplexed. How can this be, right? Right. Whatever could this mean? So the majority of them are like, okay, this is the Lord. But then verse 13, here it comes. Others mocking said they are full of new wine. Now give us a little context on that. Yeah, I mean, basically they're saying, are these people drunk? Like they're looking at them, they're like, "All right, clearly these guys, there's something wrong with them. They're this is not this is a strange activity taking place. We need to handle this, right?" They're they're dismissing, which is is interesting because we see that happening today, where we see the move of the Holy Spirit, God's moving in people's lives, and people are like, "Ah, it's just a phase. It's just a oh, you just you know you hung out with some people, got a little weird, you know, it'll pass in a couple of days. Go sleep it off." Right. Go sleep off the Holy Spirit and wake up and we'll... Hey, you're on fire for God. Just wait. When you're older like me, you won't be. Exactly. (laughs) That's not a good thing, y'all. That's not a good thing. It's amazing how quickly we squash the zeal of a young person, of a young believer. Mm. And And give them no room to fail. Yeah, at all. It's like if if you crash and burn... Obviously, that wasn't Jesus. You just need to go hang up your hat. Oh, man. Instead that's of giving so the good. opportunity to grow and to discover what God really has for them. Yeah. I tell these people all the time nobody expects you to be a perfect Christian right off the bat. Nobody expects you to be somebody who is um, passionate about the Lord and know everything about the Lord overnight. There shouldn't be an expectation of being a perfect Christian 40 years down the road because exactly. we're being sanctified. We are walking towards this. And here's what the enemy is absolutely. When we talk about the enemy, we're not talking about a foreign land. We're talking about the devil. Mm-hmm. We all have a common enemy, and it is the devil. Absolutely. The word backs this up. The enemy is terrified of who we can become, mm-hmm. not just tomorrow, mm-hmm. but when we are like Jesus in all ways. Exactly. What is the enemy terrified? He is terrified that we will continue to walk out this imperfect life mm. in this wilderness we call our lives, right. whether it's 10 years, whether it's five years, whether it's 70, whether it's 80, 90 years, whatever the shelf life is of our life, mm-hmm. he is terrified that we will never give up no matter how many times we fall down. We'll right. keep getting up, 
keep our eyes on Jesus, Mm -hmm. no matter how many times we hit rock bottom or we trip or whatever, that we'll get up, we'll put our eyes on Jesus and we'll keep moving forward. He's terrified that we will continue to do that because of who we will become, which means we will become like him in all ways because we shall be we shall be like him and he shall be seen as he is in his fullness of his glory right. there'll be no need of the sunshine anymore because of his glory there'll be no sickness there'll be no disease there'll right. be no tears the enemy is terrified that we will continue to walk this imperfect life for Jesus right yes just because we can't become perfect here on earth does not mean we can't live holy absolutely The word is clear, be holy for I am holy. Right. And just like you said, these that are mocking, the enemy's trying to use them Mm -hmm. to to stop these people short of doing what God has called them to do. Exactly. And it doesn't say specifically, but I can just imagine that those who are mocking are probably the religious leaders. They're probably the rabbis, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees who are there already mocking who Jesus was to begin with. That's right. While Jesus is on the cross. Because he was a threat. Right. He was a threat to their power, mm-hmm. their natural power, the the religious political power. And make no mistake about it, when we're talking Pharisees and Sadducees in the Bible, we're not just talking about religious. Mm-hmm. We're talking about religious slash political. Right. Because everything they were doing was political. Absolutely. Meeting behind closed doors, right. trying to figure out people who would betray Jesus because he was an affront to their political standing and their power. Exactly. So make no mistake about it, when we talk about religion there is good religion. Mm-hmm. Sure. Widows and orphans. That's that's pure, unadulterated religion. Pure, undefiled <laughs> religion. That's the Bible, y'all. Right. So when we talk about, oh, they got a religious spirit. Well, guess what? There's a good religious spirit. Exactly. You take care of the widows and the orphans. That's a good religion. And so even our terminology sometimes, but make no mistake about it. When we talk about religious Jews in the Bible that came against Jesus, it was political. Mm -hmm. They may not have been politicians, but it it may have been mass, and we see that today. Exactly. Listen, the moment you take your standing to get up on a stump for a political party, your religion has become defiled. Mm. That's true. You may be like, well, come on, Scott, let's go in Acts 2. We're in Acts 2, <laughs> We're <man>. here. <laughs> because we're bringing this to real life. The Word of God is not just some ancient mystery that doesn't apply to your life today. It is applied to our lives every single day. The moment that your pure and undefiled religion begins to take on that power struggle, it becomes political and becomes defiled. Right. And that is what the enemy is trying to use here just like they tried to stop Jesus, they're mm. trying to stop the disciples now. And it's that whole, oh, they're just drunk with wine. They're having this weird yeah, yeah. experience. Let's shut them down. Right. But look at verse 15, for 14. Mm. Man, I love this three-letter <laughs> word in the Bible. But. It's a big but, word. That means that's not the end of the story. These no. people are mocking but Peter standing up with the 11, now we kind of expect Peter to stand up. Why? Well, he's he's not the one to stay quiet. Yeah. Right? But this is a different Peter. Would you not agree? Oh, yeah. This is a, a very, this is a Peter who's been humbled. This, this guy's different. Mm-hmm. This isn't, hey, I want to sit next to Jesus and be the most powerful one, or who's right. the greatest, Jesus, or hey, Jesus, I know you said you just want to wash my feet, but mm-hmm. I want you to wash my whole body. I don't care what you want. That's not this guy. Right. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, again, he doesn't have a sound system. He doesn't have, you know, Meyer speakers or <laughs> Sure microphones or podcast mics or thousands of people. And he is like roaring above the crowd. Mm-hmm. And he says, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Other translations, uh, versions say, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, Peter's saying, listen, this is prophecy. Right. 
Like all of you religious people who are trying to come against us, this is actually the word that you say you follow Mm -hmm. being fulfilled. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And all my men servants and all my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit to those in those days. And they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, he goes into great detail with this prophecy of Joel, which in the connotation and the context of everything happening, a portion of this is being fulfilled. Right. Because in this specific instance, we don't see blood and fire and vapor of smoke. We don't see the sun being turned into darkness, moon into blood. We don't see all of that happening in this point. But what he is saying is that in the last days, now when he says last days, last days in scripture can have a certain connotation that's not this moment right here. Right. Right? Right. It's it's a time period that we're looking for. We we have been living in the last days since Jesus resurrected. And I think that's something that people need because they're always like, well when's it gonna happen? Is I, I hear it's gonna be next week. I'm, if somebody <laughs> told you it's next week, they probably don't know. Right. But um but we that's what that's part of the whole aspect. We are living in anticipation for the second coming of Christ. Yep. So good. All right, verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, wow, strong language, (laughs) have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, this is huge, the Feast of Pentecost invoking the name of David. Mm. This is big, especially for religious Jews. Some looked at Moses as a deity, Mm -hmm. almost worshiping him and what he said. Some looked at David almost as deity of what he said and what he did. Right. But here, Peter, now he has, he is... Uh, he has invoked Joel. Now he's invoking David. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch of David, that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Basically saying, listen, he's dead. Right. He's buried. He didn't come back. Right. <laughs> like he's kind of he's kind of removing all that, and he's bringing the focus to Jesus. And it says, therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. He, foreseeing this, speaking of David, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Mm. We are all witnesses of this. We saw it. Right. It's real. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Mm. Man, Peter is just, he is going in hard. Right. And he's saying everything that you're making it about as religious Jews, it's not about at all. Even your own prophets, even David prophesied about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And this Jesus who you crucified, who resurrected that we all saw, he is the one who's pouring this out, which you see. Right. You got anything? (laughs) Um, There's just so much here, Pastor. I mean, there's there's so much here that we could do three podcasts on just this one thing. I want to point out this. Invoking David carries a lot of weight, as you mentioned, because for da- for the people, David was a type of Messiah. Mm-hmm. He was the example of what the Messiah would look like. In fact, a lot of people, that's why the vocabulary, uh, son of David was such a huge aspect for them. And so he's going, the guy you look to as a Messiah prophesied to the true Messiah. 
He pointed to this Jesus. The one you're looking at, he's dead. The Lord said to my, my Lord, Lord, sit at yeah. my right hand. Exactly. He's saying, my Lord, I want to, I'm a man after God's own heart. God mm. said that about me. He, to him, he said to my Lord, right. meaning Jesus, exactly. sit at my right hand. Right. Not me, David, right. sit at the right hand of God. But Jesus, right. my Lord, right. man, that is so key here. Right. It's the humility of David that made David great. And I think that just as a side, for those of us who um, we have the opportunity to serve in some form of leadership, it's the humility that is inside of us. It goes, look, it's not about me. It's about the Lord. Let me point back to who the real Lord is. And that's yeah, what we're, it's we not a, it's not a false humility either. It's a real humility. Nor is it a lack of authority. Right. You know, humility doesn't necessarily make you a, a weak mm. person. It, it doesn't. It right. doesn't make you a doormat for everyone who wants to walk all over you. Right. Um, it just simply means that you are always aware of why you have what you have, mm -hmm. why you have the calling you have, and who gave you that calling. Right. Always keeping that. When we look at the life of David, we see that when he really, really hit bottom, mm. He got his eyes off who had given him that authority. Absolutely. And what he said was, I have the authority to stay here while I send my army into battle. I'm the king, mm -hmm. and I can send whoever I want, and I don't have to go. Mm -hmm. And basically, he stayed back when he should have been in battle, yeah. and that's when he saw Bathsheba. Right. And that's when he said, well, oh, by the way, I can have her too mm -hmm. because I'm the king. He got his eyes off of who had anointed him, right. who had gave him that. And, you know, thank God that he didn't go the way of Saul. Right. But when he was called out, he humbled himself right. and repented. Yeah. His words were, I have sinned against the Lord. I have not. Somebody else made me do it's it. Nobody else's or fault. If it's all this me, other I'm stuff. taking ownership of this. That's right. Therefore, verse 36, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, now, when they heard this, now what is this? All the stuff Peter just laid down, <laughs> they were cut to the heart. Mm. And they were convicted. That word convicted, that the Bible uses that word convicted. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Mm. Then Peter said to them, hey, guys, here's a TED talk about how to be a better human. <laughs> <laughs> did I just say that? I did just say that. You We're not going to edit that. Well, We're no, not going to edit that. We're going to leave that in there. Yeah. Not that there aren't some great TED Talks. There are some amazing Fantastic TED Talks. Fantastic TED Talks. <laughs> you knew that was coming, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Then Peter said to them, here are three steps to being a better person. No, that's not what it says either. Nope. Then Peter said to them, hey, the grace of Jesus covers everything. Just do what you want now. Mm, is this the Passion Translation? <laughs> whoa, 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 wait <laughs> a second. Sorry. That's another that podcast. Be edited. That's another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> then Peter said to them, listen to what Peter says, because it's it's a bit different than what we hear today. Right. Repent mm. and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He is saying, repent. Mm. Repent. Right. Turn from your wicked ways. Right. They know this language. Yeah. They know the law. Thereby they know about Solomon. They know about the temple. Mm. They know about the 120 at the dedication of the temple, making one noise, being in one mind, one accord. They know about the fire falling. Mm-hmm. And you can you can read all of this when when Solomon dedicates the temple. And again, that that whole thing is a type and a shadow of this mm -hmm. right here. Like that's a type and a shadow of what's going on right here. The temple was being rebuilt. They're right. doing all this stuff. They have 120 who don't keep to their divisions. They right. come making one sound, making one noise. The fire of God comes, consumes the whole place, mm. the temple. No one can say anything really. Everybody's on their face. They're wondering what's going on. Then Solomon speaks and says, Here's what's happening. Right. Then they bow their face on the pavement. And then comes that great verse that most people know. Mm. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, repent, 
Mm-hmm. Then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Right. Right. So when Peter is saying this, this is not terminology that they don't know. Mm-mm. It's terminology they know. Repent, turn from your wicked ways. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Basically, Peter is saying, this is why this is happening. This is that. Mm -hmm. This fire, these tongues, all this stuff that you hear, you've seen us in one accord saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what that means. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Right. And the word is clear that God is not willing that any should perish, right. but that all would have the gift of eternal life. Exactly. I want to point out this also. He's not talking just to like a, a group of, of harsh, unrepentant sinners who are just out there doing terrible things. He's talking to religious individuals, people who are, they're there to worship. Yeah. They've been through untold number of ceremonial acts just to be clean. That's right. And That's gone through point. all kinds of things to appear to be holy. Mm. And he's saying, hey, you have a lot of things that look good, but there's something really missing in your life, and you there, you need to repent. There's a, there's a block in your life that you have not uh, walked through yet. And you're talking about people who have traveled days, maybe weeks. Right from other nations to come to worship. Right. They're genuinely seeking the Lord. That's right. They just don't have a revelation of who Christ really is. There's been sacrifice. There's been good things that have been done. Mm -hmm. They're there for what they think is a good purpose. But we also know that Jesus rebuked the the money changers and those who were providing the sacrifices at times for feasts Mm -hmm. because they had distorted it. Mm -hmm. They had polluted it. Right. Worship now wasn't worship. Mm. That's why Jesus, you know, tells the Samaritan woman, you know, to worship now is to worship in spirit and in truth. Right. Now they're seeing the truth. They're having it revealed to them, Mm -hmm. not by Peter, but by the Holy Spirit. It says they were cut to the heart, not just because of his words, but because now the Holy Spirit is active in the scenario. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit's been poured out upon these people, and the Holy Spirit is active in this situation to cut to the heart. Mm. Verse 40, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word, Mm. not those who begrudgingly received the word, those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Wow. (laughs) That is That is awesome. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, that's important. Mm -hmm. That day, 3,000 souls were added to them. All 3,000 were baptized that day. Right. Now, you go to Jerusalem, you will see what is called mikvahs. Yeah. On the outside of the gates, you'll see that it was a place of cleaning themselves. Uh, immersion, mm-hmm. baptismal. So you would you would take off your 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 dirty linens, your dirty cloths. You would step down in. You would immerse yourself. You would go down the steps. You would immerse yourself. You would come back out, and in terminology, you were clean. Right. Right. Same thing with washing feet. You would go into somebody's house. They would offer to wash your feet. And now you're clean. You can come into that house clean. Mm-hmm. You you would see those who were tending to the temple and with the ashes and all the different things. And when they would pull the ashes out to keep the flame burning, to keep the, the fire on the altar burning, they would take off their dirty clothes and then they would put on clean clothes representing being clean. Right. Again, all these things matter. Yeah. Like all these <laughs> things, because now the type and shadows that were just type and shadows before mm-hmm. are now real. Yeah. It's very real, not exterior, but inside now. The circumcision is not exterior, it's inside. Right. Now the cleanliness is not outside, it's inside. When I'm baptized and I go down and I come out, inside there's been a change. Right. And the fact that 3,000 people would be, be baptized in one day. That's quite a bit. <laughs> not in one tank, right? Right. Not in one, you got to realize in Jerusalem, Mikvahs were everywhere. Right. 
So we don't know if like they were just like, okay, everybody spread out around town. <laughs> Find a place. <laughs> like Peter, you're over there. You're going to baptize 174 people. Right. And you know, you're over here. Yeah, Matthias, and, you're new, but you're over there, bro. <laughs> right. You got about 900 people to baptize today. Well, it's not necessarily that they were baptizing people. It was people were going down right. unto themselves mm -hmm. and coming out. And so it it was this exterior declaration that now Christ is my Savior to an interior work, right? which speaks of even baptism today, mm -hmm. right? That bab baptizing in water doesn't save you. Right. It is, a, it is a public declaration. It is a public step that you take, mm -hmm. that you can take to say, I am a follower of Jesus. It's right. an inward work. It's a public declaration of an inward work. Right. All right. So all this is going on. And so here's the question now. All right. Now there's this unbelievable supernatural thing that happens. Preach the gospel. All these people have given their lives to Christ. All these people have been baptized. Now what? Question mark. Mm -hmm. Because that's kind of the question mark even today. Yeah. Like, okay, I've given my life to Christ. Man, I've been baptized in water. Man, God's doing these things in my life. Now what? Or... I came to this amazing service and these amazing things happened to me. And these people told me these steps and I did the ABCs and I prayed this prayer and I did all this stuff and I feel like God's moving in my life. Now what? Right. Verse 42. And they continued. Ooh. Those are big words for us here at the healing place. One of my favorite things is an ellipsis. Mm -hmm. You will see me use it everywhere <laughs> because unless something is over, I never put a period. Mm -hmm. If there's a continuation, an ellipsis needs to be there because that means something is continuing to move. It's continuing to grow. It's right. continuing. And they continued. Like They just continued. They didn't get so enraptured in that moment that they, they wanted to be like, oh, let's go back to the upper room and kind of hang out in the glory of this. Mm -hmm. No. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Mm. They have this amazing encounter with the presence of God. The Holy Spirit's moving powerfully. So what's one of the first things that they do? They continue in doctrine. Mm. Discipleship. Getting Discipleship. into the root of what's happening here. What is God saying? What is God's word? What is God saying? And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. <laughs> Hanging out with Christians. Right. Doing life together. Really? <laughs> We're supposed to do that? In the breaking of bread. Well, wait a second. I'm a Christian. That means I don't fast 24-7? No, we mm. break bread. Right. We eat. We yeah. hang out. Now, here at the Healing Place, we say do that in a healthy manner. Yeah. You know, <laughs> not a couple of triple cheeseburgers and all that. We want to we wanna be life-giving, and we right. want to be all of that. Um, at the same time, we want to enjoy. Uh, my birthday was this past weekend, mm -hmm. and... I went somewhere that I had not gone in almost three years. Really? I had real, real, real marshmallow chocolate ice cream. Wow. Inside a waffle cone. What? I mean, you know, for me, that's like... That's big for you. That's like eating a dozen <laughs> Krispy Kreme donuts. Like for some people, it's like that was a major deal for me. Right. Now, I did follow that by drinking at least 100 ounces of water <laughs> Gotta to filter system. it all out of my system. <laughs> but the breaking of bread... Right. And guess who brought, one of my children brought it to me. Oh, that's so good. Right? Brought it to me. So there was fellowship in that. There right. was blessing in that. There was there was favor in that. It made me feel a certain way. Right. Not because of what I was eating, but the literal breaking of it with someone else who thought enough to bring that to me. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why fellowship and being with one another is so important. And even in the breaking of bread, Dallas, I, I know... I don't know about you, but I know for us and our family, there were a lot of life decisions done around a table. Absolutely. And you will hear that a lot when you when you either come to the healing place or you hear, we're always talking about come to the table. Right. Even when we normally present something from the platform, there's a table. It's right. not a pulpit. It's, it's It a literally table. is a shadow of we're coming to a table to hear what the Lord is saying. Mm -hmm. When Jesus gave some of his last instructions to his disciples, it was around a table. Right. Right. So don't diminish the table. Mm. Breaking of bread and in prayers. So imagine that. They just didn't come together and eat and talk about football. Right. They were praying to the Lord. 
Okay. And then verse 43 is super interesting to me. Then fear came upon every soul, every soul. We're talking thousands. Mm-hmm. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Walk through that real quick, Dallas, on that. Then fear came upon every soul. So when you look at the situation here, there's a lot, there's a lot that's happening here. You have people who have decided to follow Jesus, mm-hmm. a person that in the um, has been ostracized by the the leaders of the Jewish community. They have said, mm-hmm. "Hey, this Jesus is not one of us." And uh, they have a they have a habit here where if you decide to f- uh, go away from what they have established, you're shunned. You're locked out of the community. Yeah. So now you have people who have gone, "I'm following Jesus." A whole community of individuals who have said, "Jesus is the mes- the Messiah. He's the one that we've been waiting for. We're going to follow him, even though the religious leaders say he's not. We believe it." Now they're being kicked out of whole households. Yeah. What did Jesus point. say in the, in, back in, in the Gospels? He said that there will be times where brother will be turning against brother, father against son. You'll be it's sh- happening immediately. In, in real time. <laughs> and on top of that, you have a bigger political play happening because now you have, there's rumors of like, well, you know, did you hear the disciples had taken the body of Jesus? They broke the seal in the tomb and they've, they've taken it. Now, now Rome's after them. Yep. Now there's a lot of things taking place at the one time. The political... Like fake news just didn't start a couple years ago. No. <laughs> right? Like these little religious, politically motivated nuggets were being dropped into people's minds. Mm. And then the political powers that be also were creating a false narrative as well. Right. To try to stop this from happening. Right. It's happening now mm-hmm. to stop us from meeting and fellowshipping and breaking bread together and praying and gathering and worshiping Jesus and declaring the gospel and all those things. Mm. It continues to this day, and right. there's always there's always going to be naysayers who are going to come. When you have an encounter with God, mm. when you're growing, when you're going after God, there are always going to be naysayers who are going to come and try to plant seeds of doubt in you, and that's where you got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Right. And when it says, then fear came upon every soul, it's also a connotation of when God is moving, there should be some awe right. and wonder. Mm-hmm. For a lot of us especially in America, Christians, we may have lost our awe and wonder a little bit of how good God is and what he's doing Mm -hmm. because we kind of get just used to it. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody prayed a prayer. That's awesome. No, we should be in awe and wonder that this person is becoming a new creation. Mm. We should still have awe and wonder. I should not look at my story and go, ah, it's okay. Right. 27 and a half years later, when I think about my encounter with Jesus, I should still be in awe and wonder because that moment changed the trajectory of our entire life, our family, our kids, our grandchildren, family members who have received Christ, the untold thousands of people that we've been blessed to be a part of their lives, and the impact of that one moment. Mm. That one moment of not anything ascribed to us, but that one moment in the presence of Jesus, I should still have the awe and wonder that God would have chosen that moment to change everything in my life. And that today I get the privilege and the honor to sit around a table and to talk about the word of God and to study the word of God. Mm. Because in that moment, it wasn't about me saying yes to Jesus. It was that Jesus said yes to me right? even before I said yes to him. Absolutely. And that should continue. And sadly, I have not, I have lost sight of that at times in my life. Mm -hmm. I've just thought, yeah, you know, my story is not any different. It may not be any different, but it's still a story. Yeah. And it's still an encounter with God that changed everything. Sure. And so verse 44, now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Man, that's a good lesson. (laughs) sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had had need. Now, some people would take verse 44 and 45 to kind of bring a socialist commentary into this of saying, Mm -hmm. but I think it's been proven over hundreds and hundreds of years that when people try to isolate themselves and pull themselves away, that um, in almost every case, it either becomes dictatorship, tyranny, or people get their eyes on a person. Right rather than their eyes on Jesus, and that always ends up terrible, and that's how cults are started. Exactly. That's not what's happening here. Verse 46, so continuing daily, wow, not just when they come to church. Right. 
continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Wow. Probably need to get back to that a little bit. <laughs> not shoving a sub sandwich down your throat when you're driving down Burt Coons in a traffic jam. That's probably not the way to do it, right? Probably not. Those of you who aren't from Shreveport, Burt Coons... Yeah, it lived up to the hype today, just saying on my it, way here. It is a, the place where people find Jesus <laughs> in more than one reason. Sometimes it is the <laughs> it is a prayer rabbit channel. hole that you get lost in, man. <laughs> but they are eating with gladness and simplicity of heart. One accord, again, one in spirit. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Mm. Any final thoughts, Dallas? Listen, I know you guys are like, man, you are not going to get through Acts chapter 2 in 15 minutes. I'm just sorry. It's not going to be tweetable. It's not going to be 140 <laughs> characters. There is a lot in there, and there should be. Yeah. And one thing that we didn't even hit is that there are no Gentiles there. Nope. Not a single one. And we're going to get into that later. Um, I do That's wanna... a good... <laughs> little little <laughs> foreshadow, is it the word? Yeah, right. So... I don't want to put this out. They they continue daily, and then they saw salvations every day. I think some people they live event to event. You know, um, we we hype up. Hey, we're gonna have a special Sunday service. We're gonna have a special uh, gathering with with this or that. Or we're gonna have a youth convention or whatever. These people saw salvations on the daily because they lived it daily. It wasn't, yeah. they didn't live it event to event. They lived it daily, and I really believe that some of you are looking for God to move in your life. And you're living day or event to event, Sunday to Sunday, rather daily, living this life out with other key word, other believers yeah, in so your good. life. You cannot isolate yourself and really see God move. Now, sometimes there are t times where we're called to the wilderness, mm -hmm. but those are times that when we're in the wilderness, those are times for prayer and really seeking the Lord. And then when you come out, you're going full force in community with people. And these people were in community, and that's why they saw God move on a daily basis. Well, it's messy. It's uncomfortable. It's, you know, I don't always like the people who follow Jesus. Well, they may not like you either. I guarantee you some disciples <laughs> didn't like Peter. They, they're like, Peter, you cut off a dude's ear. What are you doing? It's so <laughs> we, when I say we, we can probably put this in an American category, but I think it's probably global. Mm -hmm. We can become like the world in many ways to where if we don't feel it or we feel a certain way or we don't really like this or like that, mm -hmm. we just cut people off. Yeah. We cut things off. We we cut off what God is actually doing in our life because we may not like it. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of things I don't like, but there's one thing I love, and that's Jesus. Right. And what I find is, is that when I love Jesus with everything that's within me, mm -hmm. that I begin to love things that I don't like. Mm-hmm. I begin to love people that maybe I didn't like, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you know who the first person is? Myself. Yeah. That when I learn to love Jesus with everything I've got, I can learn to love the person that I look in the mirror and see. Mm. Not because he's awesome, but because now I'm seeing him in the light of my love for Christ. Yeah. And now I can know that in Christ, that Scott that I'm looking at, although imperfect, although maybe hard to understand sometimes and and difficult at times but i can learn to love him because he's in christ right sometimes i think we get that whole you know love the lord your god with everything that and then love your neighbor as yourself we get that we're like okay it's the lord and it's others and then it's me well that's not the way that reads mm -hmm. love your neighbor as yourself you love the lord mm -hmm. with everything right. then you will learn to love yourself and right. out of that you mm. can really learn to love that's others so good because then you begin to see that your frail humanity is their frail humanity. And right. when you can learn to love yourself in Christ, right. not loving yourself because you're good and great and all this other stuff, that worldly language, I'm not good enough and I'm not great enough. And that's why I need Jesus. Right. That's why I need the Holy Spirit every <laughs> single day. That's why I need the fruit of the Holy Spirit to be manifested in my life every day because in Scott, it's the works of the flesh. Right. But in Christ, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Absolutely. All right. Good stuff. Dallas, you want to pray us out today? Yeah, absolutely. Lord, we just thank you for your presence and your grace, and we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We thank you that you've given this to us, that we have this, this amazing gift. And this is you speaking to us 
through these pages. Yeah. And I thank you for the example of the, the, the disciples and the early church lived in front of us to follow you daily, to serve you daily, to do life with other believers, to challenge each other, to break bread with each other, to lift each other up on the daily basis. And we thank you, Lord, that as we do that ourselves, Lord, we're going to see you move. Mm -hmm. You're going to break strongholds in our personal yeah. lives, Lord. Yeah. You're going to help yeah. us to see ourselves in a biblical manner. Mm -hmm. You're going to help us to see other people in a biblical manner. And yeah. out of that, we'll see the kingdom grow. We'll see revival break. God, we're praying for a day where we see 3,000 souls saved in a single day mm -hmm. and then adding to the kingdom on a daily basis so here in Shreveport. Or whether there are people living in Minden, in Bossier, in, in the Philippines, in India, Lord, we are praying yep. for these revivals to take place as people get a revelation of who Jesus truly is. Thank you, Lord, for all these things. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, thanks for tuning in to the Midweek Move, and uh, we're having a blast. We hope you guys are having a blast. And... Um, Stay tuned. More bridges, more segues to come. Oh, yeah. And hey, if, if you want to stay connected with us on a regular basis, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash midweek move, where uh, we'll have some questions and answer stuff on there and other great things for you to get uh, in touch with us. Awesome. God bless you.